Revelation chapter 17 and 18 are probably uh, probably the two hardest chapters to understand in the book. So we're going to take a breath. We're going to slow down. If you have any questions going through, let's don't wait to the end. Just throw your hand up and we'll stop and uh, address it there. So Revelation chapter uh, 17 to get started. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. Because Revelation chapter 17 and 18, we will not get a grasp of what John is saying and what John is trying to get across to us unless we have a broad overview of biblical prophecy and the whole prophetic nature specifically of the book of Daniel. Because what Daniel chapter 2 talks about, John's going to address and John's going to allude to and John's going to talk about. So, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? Well, maybe you don't remember. Daniel is a captive boy in, in Babylon. He has been taken captive with a bunch of other uh, Jewish boys. So Daniel is a young man at this point. Teens. He's in his teens at this point. Okay? Maybe late teens. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he had a dream, and he... He was tired of his wise men and his soothsayers and all those people making stuff up. So he puts a challenge out to them. He says, you will tell me what I dreamed, and then you will interpret my dream. And if you don't do that, I will put every wise man in the country to death. So that put a whole lot of pressure because Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were being trained to be wise men, being trained to to join that group that advised the king. And so they're going to be killed if nobody can tell Nebuchadnezzar what he dreamed. And so Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get together and they seek God's face. They pray to God and ask God for help. And God reveals it to Daniel. And so Daniel goes back and goes into the presence of the king. And he says, hey, I'm, I'm here to interpret your, to tell you your dream and interpret your dream. So let's pick up the story. In Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 25. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles of Ju from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, that's what he had been renamed, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar, to, to King Nebuchadnezzar, what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in the bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the, more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening, and the head of the image was fine gold, its chest, its arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell you the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, and into the, whose hands he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beast of the field and the birds of heaven, making you rule over them all. 
you are the head of gold. So Babylon was the head of gold, right, in the statue. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. Okay, we see in the statue, as it goes down the statue, the, the metals become less precious, right? So Nebuchadnezzar is the standard. The king of Babylon was the standard of what man's king, it's the epitome of what man can do as, apart from God in its magnificence. We've all heard about the hanging Bab, uh, gardens of Babylon. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. It was a magnificent kingdom. Each successive kingdom has some rougher edges than Babylon did. So that's what it means that, that they're going down in value. All right. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. That's the Medo-Persian Empire. And yet a third kingdom of bronze. That's the Greek Empire, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. That's the Roman Empire, okay? Because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. As you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it. But at, as just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay, and as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage. But they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with the clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break to pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. It shall stand forevermore just as you saw that a stone was cut from the mountain by no human hand and that it broke in pieces the iron the bronze the clay the silver and the gold a great god has made known to the king what shall be after this the dream is certain and its interpretation sure what god had given nebuchadnezzar in a dream and what he gives to daniel as the interpretation of that dream is a is a sweeping overview of world history it, there have been there will be seven and we'll see in chapter 8, or 17, eight world empires. But the eighth one is part of the seven. Okay? We'll get there when we get back to Revelation. Seven successive world empires that will be the dominant power on the planet. It began with the Egyptians. The Egyptians were followed by the Assyrians. But by the time Daniel is on the scene, it's the Babylonians. So the Egyptians and the Assyrians, their power had already come and went. So from Daniel's time forward, we see these successive empires. We've got the, the Babylonians, which Daniel was living in. We've got the Medo-Persians, which Daniel also lived in and served the Medo-Persian king. Then we have the Greeks under Alexander the Great. Then we have the Roman Empire. And as we go down the legs, we see that the Roman Empire split. It split into the Eastern Empire and the Western Empire. If you recall your, your world history, those of you who took it. Right, the Roman Empire became so large and so big and so difficult to manage, they split under two emperors. The Eastern Empire, which was there at Constantinople, Istanbul today, and the Western Roman Empire was at Rome. And what this is saying in Daniel's dream, what this is saying is, or Nebuchadnezzar's dream, what this is saying is, the Roman Empire will never truly go away because in the latter days, signified by the feet mixed partly with miry clay and partly with iron, that it will have military strength. It will have overwhelming military strength, but it will be held together by factions, right? Dan, Daniel uses the word, they'll come together as in marriage, but they won't hold together. So there'll be squabbles and we see that all over the world, don't we? We see it even among our allies. So, this is the, the, the toes symbolize the kingdom of the Antichrist that we've been talking about in Revelation. It will be a revision of the Roman Empire. Okay? It's going to be a revision of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire never truly goes away. I think we talked about that earlier. The, the United States is a, is a manifestation of the Roman Empire. 
Europe, the Western European nations are a manifestation of the Roman Empire because we come from the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire owned England. It conquered England. So the Roman Empire had a great influence on the English, even when they left in the 400s. And our institutions are set up like the Roman Empire, well, the Roman Republic, but even during the Roman Empire, they still had a Senate. They still had a house of uh, the plebeians, which was like our house of representatives. We have a Senate. So our systems of government in the democracies are set up after the Roman Empire. And in the latter days, the Roman Empire will reconstitute itself in the Antichrist's empire that we talked about with the 10 administrative districts, right? We got 10 toes, most of us. Some of us may meet not, some of us, but most of us have 10 toes. Right, there'll be ten administrative districts in the Rome in the revived Roman Empire, the Empire of the Antichrist, and they'll be fractious to some degree. So, questions about Daniel chapter two? Let's turn back to Revelation chapter seventeen. It's kind of funny that you're covering that right now because um, we went over Daniel chapter two today. Did you really? <laughs> yeah, we did. It's amazing how <laughs> God did I mess up? Yeah. But you just helped confirm what I was saying earlier. So <laughs> oh, good. On the same page. I like that. All right. We're going to read the entirety of chapter 17. Then we're going to go back and take it bit by bit. All right. But we need we need the, the whole context of the whole chapter. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, that's the seven angels from chapter 16 that poured out God's wrath. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers of earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written the name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven horn heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, another has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not and is, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. They are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. For he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, and those, who, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw... They and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Easy to understand, right? All right. Hopefully it will be. Keep in mind Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the successive world empires. Now, who is the prostitute? That's the first question. Who or what does the prostitute stand for? 
turn back to the book of Genesis, beginning in chapter 13. When you do your weekly Bible reading or reading through the Bible, I'm sure you don't recall much about Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13 is called the Tables of the Nations. But there's some nuggets in there. Well, actually, chapter 10. Chapter 13 is the Tower of Babel. Chapter 10 is the, is the Table of Nations. Turn to chapter 10, verse 13. Or verse 12. No, verse... Well, let's go back to verse 8, 6. Now, these are listing the generations of Noah. Noah's descendants. And I see y'all laughing at me. Don't, don't think I don't see it. I can see all of them. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, put Egypt. Don't let that throw you. Uh, most most translations will have the the Aramaic name for Egypt. Uh, uh, Misraim, I believe. Misraim. Anybody's translation say Misraim. That that's most often is translated Egypt when it's talking about the nation of Egypt. This is talking about a name. So the ESV continues the the typical translation of Egypt, but I think the other ones turn it into, leave it untranslated so it separates and it doesn't confuse people like apparently it is now. Egypt is a name, Misraim. It's translated Egypt. And it means the place of the Cushites. That's, that's what Misraim means. Just that's neither here nor there. It's your trivia for today. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabat, Rama, and Sabateka, the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan, Cush, father Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, the beginnings of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalnea in the land of Shinar. Okay, now turn over to chapter 13. This will make sense. It's not, no, chapter 11, excuse me. I'm just getting messed up with my chapters. Chapter 11. Who's heard of the Tower of Babel? Tower of Babel. Now the whole earth had one language and, it, and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. That's where Babylon is. It's in, in Iraq. Okay, the plains of Shinar is in Iraq and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. They said, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with, and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be, be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower and which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their languages so that they may, be un may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the all of the earth. And they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the city. Now, we often talk about it, especially when we're teaching children Sunday school. This is why we have all the different languages, and it is, right? That's the practical outcome of what God did. That's why we have all the languages, but there's something else going on. Back in chapter 10, where did Nimrod begin his kingdom? We just read it, Babel, right? So the Tower of Babel, Nimrod is behind that. Nimrod leads the first rebellion against God. Right? God, when he told Noah, I want you to, you know, you and your children spread out all over the whole earth, populate the whole earth. And Nimrod keeps them together. Nimrod was the first dictator. And Nimrod changes proper worship of God to the false worship of the creatures. Remember what Romans 1 says? They refused to worship God, so he gave them over to the reprobate minds to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. So in Babel, 
at the Tower of Babel, what it actually is, what actually is going on, is a false religious system being set up by Nimrod and his kingdom, and thus begins all of the false religions that Satan, who was behind them all, has been using throughout the centuries to deceive mankind. That's who the mystery. That's who the woman on the beast is. It's a stand. It's it's a it's a symbolic thing that stands for all of the blasphemous religions that has existed beginning at the Tower of Babel all the way through today and all the way through the end, right? That makes sense. It began at Babylon or Babel before it was Babylon. It began at Babel and it's the false religious systems of mankind. The key to understanding that is when it talks when the Bible talks about their sexual immorality in a way, in a symbolic way, that is not just simply talking about a human being doing something. Right? When he tells me I should not be sexually immoral, that means I should I should not indulge my flesh sexually. When he's talking about talking about the language in this manner, what he's talking about is spiritual immorality, spiritual um, unfaithfulness. God sees spiritual unfaithfulness. God sees God sees all of the false religions on the planet in a very, very harsh way. And the language he uses brings that across. She's the great harlot setting on the, the beast. She has she has made all of mankind who have not been written in the name in the book of life, made them drunk on her blasphemies and drunk on her immoralities, right? She has led mankind astray from the one true God. And God sees that and equates it with a spiritual sexual immorality because we should be faithful to God. And those who are not faithful to God are committing adultery against God, right? He's our creator. So we, we serve and go chase after other gods and it affects God like it happens in a marriage when somebody strays from a marriage. That despair and that hurt and that anger, that's, that's how, we, uh, how God feels when his creatures chase other gods that are not gods at all. Satan, all other false religions serve and worship a created thing, and Satan desires that worship. He's the first created being, and he desires that worship. He's the highest created being, and he desires that worship. Did that help? I told you chapter 17 is easy. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me and said, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. Down in the chapter, he tells us where the many waters are. The many waters are the peoples, the languages, the nations, right? The whole earth it's in its history. Chapter 16 was a chronological overview of the last three and a half years. Now God has John go back and describe so we've left the chronology again, and we're going back and looking at the overview. The great prostitute has existed from the Tower of Babel until the very last days. Okay? So it's not one moment in time that this, this creature is. John is given a vision, and he sees false religion as God sees false religion. So God looks upon all false religions as this hideous creature. As this hideous thing that is lit, that is leading people astray and has led millions upon millions upon millions in a false hope with a false god. Yes, ma'am. So is this, um, I know earlier in Revelation we talked about the mark of the beast and how if you have the mark of the beast, you can never um, be saved or um, be part of, you know, like God will never save you um yeah. so is that was that kind of what it's talking about with the woman like there's she can never come back from that so she's like she has the mark is that the same thing or is this different that, this, we have to understand this this woman riding the beast doesn't stand for a person it stands for a religious system a religious system that involves buddhism it involves confucianism uh, it involves shintoism it involves the false uh those who claim to be Christians and they're not, it, it involves any religion that worships and serves anything other than God. 
in the in the biblical manner, right? So Jehovah's Witnesses fall up under this woman, this prostitute. They're part of the prostitute. Muslims are part of the prostitute, right? Any the Wiccans are part of the prostitute. It's the prostitute stands for all false religious systems, as opposed to the one true faith. Okay, and God sees all of them equally. He sees the Jehovah's Witnesses equal with the Wiccans, with the Mormons, with the with the Islamists, with the Buddhists. All of them are equal in God's eyes, and He sees them like this. Right? We we see the Mormons, and they're great people. They're very nice people, pleasant folks. God sees them as this because they're worshiping and serving something other than him. They're worshiping and serving Satan. Because we see... Would you mind... Huh? I'm sorry. No, Would no, you no. mind refreshing my memory on what... Who falls under Mark of the Beast then? I, I feel like I like maybe misheard that before. Yeah, the Mark of the Beast... In the, in the latter day, in the, in the tribulation period, the beast is the Antichrist, okay? The Antichrist will be um, possessed by Satan at some point. And when it is possessed by Satan, then the Antichrist, who now is Satan, right, in, the, in possession of the Antichrist, you know, we, we see the movies, right, the spirits possess, right, we read about it in Scripture, Satan actually possesses the Antichrist. And Satan demands worship. That's what he wants. So he has the false prophet who is the head of the latter days one world religion. All of these religions will combine. All religions will combine at the end of, end of days. Okay, when we get to the tribulation. All religions will combine into one world religion headed by what's called the false prophet here. And the false prophet sets up a, a idol in the temple in the Jewish temple, and the beast and the false prophet, the Antichrist and the false prophet, demand everybody get a mark of the beast on their hands or their forehead. And if they don't get the mark of the beast, which is a sign, I choose to worship the Antichrist. I choose him as my God, as opposed to Jehovah. So and so there's never coming back from that. No, it's a, it, no, it's, it's a choice. It's a conscious choice where they say, they have to make a choice between Jehovah God or the Antichrist. And so they make a choice. I serve him. I serve the Antichrist. At that moment, God says, you chose. Right? You chose. They had all the information they could need. Right? God has given them. They had the, the two prophets standing there preaching all over the world. And when the Antichrist finally kills them, they celebrate. Because they have chosen the Antichrist. They're cursing God throughout all of these things, and they choose the Antichrist. So the mark of the beast is a conscious choice to serve and worship the Antichrist and a conscious choice to disregard Jehovah God and Jesus. Okay. okay. I understand now. It almost seems like the opposite of uh, salvation because, like, when we accept Jesus, there's no going back. There's no and the same back. thing with the mark of the beast, except... You know, like at this point, if there's unbelievers, there's always a chance that they could be saved before they die. But at that point, they made their choice. And I think it goes back to, to the unpardonable sin that we find in the gospel. Because Jesus says there's one thing that will never be forgiven. There's one thing that can never be forgiven. And if you read it in context, it's when you have all the information you have, you need. Because he says it to the Pharisees. Jesus... We might not get finished in chapter 17 tonight. Jesus says, uh, Jesus comes and he does what's called messianic miracles. Through the Old Testament scriptures, there are some miracles that the, the Pharisees and the teachers and the students of the law rightly understood only the Messiah will be able to do these miracles. One was uh, healing a man who was born blind. One was cleansing a Jewish leper, right? All of these, there's, there was a series of messianic miracles. They were to be signs to the nation of Israel. The Messiah is here because only the Messiah will do these things. Jesus does them. Jesus does them, right? And so when he's giving them the, the unpardonable sin, it's right around that time where, remember the Bible story when 
Jesus is, is in a house and he's surrounded. The house is crowded. Well, he's surrounded by the Pharisees because they understand he's doing these messianic miracles. They had a program in place where when somebody claimed to be the Messiah or somebody was suspected of being the, the Messiah, they would send delegations out to examine it, to examine and see if it really was the Messiah. Jesus has proved beyond using their own teaching. He has proved it to them. I'm your Messiah. Then they're gathered around him and they're firing questions at him, trying to trip him up. And the guy's friends take the roof apart and lower the, lower the lame man down in the midst of him, right? So he's, Jesus is surrounded by the leadership of the nation. He has proved that he's the Messiah by doing the messianic miracles that they said they needed to be done. Here lays this poor man. And Jesus does something very, very different than he had before. He doesn't say, son, I say, pick up your mat and walk. He doesn't just heal the man. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. And that caused a great stir. What do you mean his sins are forgiven? Well, Jesus just proven he's the Messiah. He's the son of David. He's the son of God. And then he says, oh, who can forgive sins but God? And they say, yeah, that's right. And Jesus said, to show you I have the authority to forgive sins on earth, son, pick up your mat and walk. And he heals him instantly. He has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt to the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees who had come out to examine him. He is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so rather than accept that, because Jesus is bringing a kingdom that they don't want, because if he's the Messiah, they're going to lose their place. They're going to lose their privilege. They're going to lose their comfort and their ease and their money. So rather than accept Jesus as the King of Kings and their Messiah, they say, oh, he does it by the power of the devil. They choose not to support the Messiah God sent. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, every sin will be forgiven man except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What that means is the Holy Spirit had revealed to them without any doubt, this is your Messiah. Trust in him. And they chose Satan instead. That is the unpardonable sin. And that's what these people do when they take the mark of the beast. Does that help? Might have been a little long-winded, but did that help? Okay. All right, we can get a little farther. So the, the great prostitute is, is all of humankind's from the Tower of Babel to present day and even in the future, all of our attempts to create a religion ourselves as opposed to simply believing and trusting in God. Woman was red, blah, 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 blah. And it started in Babylon. That's why that's why we went back to Tower of Babylon. Because uh, written on her forehead was written the name of mystery. Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and the earth's abomination. Mother of all false religions comes from Babel, or Babylon. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. A couple of things going on here. The beast who was and is not and is again. Right? Seems to be talking about a resurrection. Remember we, when we introduced ourselves to the Antichrist. The Antichrist, when we went back in the Old Testament prophets, the Antichrist suffers a wound. That's a seemingly mortal wound, but Satan either keeps him alive, right? Or he, he really not mortally wounded. It just seems like it is. And they play up this, that he has come back from the dead. The Antichrist does not rise from the dead. It just seems like he rises from the dead. So it's a trick that they play on Hall of Humanity. Remember, Satan is trying to emulate the true Godhead. So he wants his Christ to also be resurrected. He wants to emulate what Christ has done. So the Antichrist suffers a, a wound his eye and his arm or, or he, he loses an eye and he loses the use of one arm but he doesn't actually die he just seems to have died so that's what daniel is alluding to but he's also alluding to the time when satan will take control of the antichrist the beast comes up from the bottomless pit and is about to go to destruction 
So this, the woman is riding the beast who is in reality Satan. It's the same beast we see in chapter 12, right? And the Antichrist has been possessed by Satan. So that's who's carried all the false religions along since Babel till now, has been Satan. He's been the inspiration of all of them. He's been the instigation behind all of them. Questions there? I think it's interesting where it kind of makes a comparison because um, Jesus is called, said as the one who was, is, and is to come. It almost seems like a play on that with these words. Yeah, it is. All right. This calls for mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Now, I know Rome was founded on seven mountains, but I think that's not, not exactly what's in view here. Yes, it's the revived Roman Empire. I don't know that Rome itself will be the... the the city of it, the, the capital city of it, and Rome was founded on seven hills. However, hills can also mean military power or, or governmental power. And remember, there's seven world empires. Okay? So, seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is and the other is not yet come. That goes right back to Daniel chapter 2. Right? It's talking about successive world empires. Those seven heads. Uh, five of whom had fallen. Remember, this is in John's day. The Roman Empire is still there. So we've got the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the um, Medo-Persians, and the Greeks. That's five who had risen and fallen. One who is, is Rome. Five of whom have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. That's the revived Roman Empire, the Antichrist is empire. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven. And it goes to destruction. Again, it's talking about Satan. Satan finally takes control of all human government at the end when he, when he indwells the Antichrist. But he belongs to the seven. And it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings. Remember the ten toes in Nebuchadnezzar's vision? Dream? Ten, ho ten toes of the statue? And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power. But they are to receive authority as kings for one hour. Just a short time. Together with the beast. They are of one mind and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb. And the lamb will conquer them. For he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. And then the angel said to me, the woman, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over the royal power to the beast. Until the words of God are fulfilled, and the woman you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. So what's going on there at the very end of chapter 17? The ten kings and the beast, that's Satan, the Antichrist, have been using the one world religion all along to consolidate power. But Satan, who is now in indwelling the Antichrist, has always been interested in one thing. He wants to be God. He wants to be worshipped openly. He doesn't want to share his worship with a religious system. He doesn't want to share his worship with anything. So he will never be satisfied until he can stand up and be himself as Lucifer and receive the accolades and worship of people. Not through an idol. Not through a religious system. Not through uh, religious ceremonies. Not through sacrifices. None of that has satisfied his, his need and desire to be worshipped. And so when he finds himself sharing the glory with the false religious system, he and the Ten Kings turn on false religion and finally destroy religion for all time in their minds. They destroy all religion in the last half of the tribulation period. So that's chapter 17.
Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Question. I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult, guys. And if you don't want to ask a question here, come on in, baby. If you don't want to ask a question here, write it down or email me. Or we'll talk about it whenever Sunday or call me later. What? Cheryl okay. has a question. So my question is, we can read the end of the world in Revelation. Yes. We've, we've seen glimpses of it in the Old Testament, and then now it's evolving in the New and Revelation. Okay, so Satan reads. He knows Satan it more than we do. Satan is smart. So yeah. how does he think that he can just keep throwing, like the cops throw out that thing, and it, brrr, and it ruins their tire? It's like Satan keeps throwing those things out, trying to defeat or trying to throw us off track. He, how, why? Well... It goes back to why he failed. He has deluded himself that he is equal to God. He has deluded himself that he is as smart as God. Yeah. He has deluded himself. And at this point, it's a willful delusion. Yes, he knows the scripture better than we do. Right? When he tempts Jesus in the wilderness, he quotes the scripture to it. He knows the scripture. In, he knows it inside and out. So, yes, he's familiar with the book of Revelation. Yes, he's familiar with how God says it will end. He still thinks he can change that. This is why he's been fighting the Jews all these years. Because he knows, Jesus said, I will not come back the second time to defeat Satan until the Jews who are left call out for me, recognize me as their Messiah, and call out for me to come. Satan said, if I can kill the Jews, I'll Nobody make Jesus a liar. Nobody can call out, Jesus can come back, and I win. Okay. So it's, it's a willful delusion to me. It, that's the way it seems. But yes, he, he is well aware of what the scripture says. Okay. But he was persuasive kind of enough to bring a third of the angels with him. Yeah. Yes. We kind of came across that in um, Daniel chapter three today. We're studying about King Nebuchadnezzar. How he had that vision from Daniel, and Daniel told him you, these are the different kingdoms. And it seemed like King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to change history by making that statue and saying, no, it's all going to be gold. It's, it's all, all going to be like all gold. Yeah. So, same thing. <laughs> yep. it's, it's delusion. And what happens to Nebuchadnezzar? I don't know if you've got there. Are y'all going through Daniel? Yeah, we are. We haven't, haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> okay, well, I, I won't spoil it for him. But Nebuchadnezzar pays for his, his arrogance. And we see at the end of, of that episode that you'll read about or, or study about, Nebuchadnezzar has a change of heart in his relationship and his attitude towards God. So, Which Satan never will. It for everybody else. <laughs> which, which Satan never will. He, he will not have a change of heart like that. <laughs> no, because in, even if he's after he's bound for a thousand years, God releases him and he tries the very same thing. So, total, total, total evil is what Satan is. Yeah, this is probably one of the most bizarre chapters in the Bible, I think. <laughs> it is, and it is difficult, and it, you just have to take a step back and say, okay, what is John doing? John is giving me an overview. Chapter 17 is an overview of the, the role that false religion has played in God and mankind's relationship since the Tower of Babel all the way to the end. False religions have seduced mankind. They have seduced mankind into following something, worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. They have led people away from God. That's Satan's purpose. All false religions, he's behind all false religions because at, he's back there taking in that worship. When the Muslims are, are going around that little rock, that little square black rock in Mecca, he's in that square rock just going, oh, they're worshiping me. They're worshiping me when he knows they're really not worshiping him. They're worshiping Allah, right? And here at the end, he wants the worship. He wants the, the outward worship. So no more Muslim, no more Allah, no more Buddha, no more nothing. It's me. You will worship me. So that's what chapter 17 is and the ultimate destruction and the judgment. God actually uses the Antichrist and the Ten Kings to judge false religion, all false religions at the end. So 17 is the destruction and the judgment and the description of all the false religious systems that has ever existed. Chapter 18 is the, the judgment and the description of all mankind's attempts at governing ourselves without God, 
right? So chapter 18 is the destruction of, man, of man's government. Chapter 17, destruction of man's religions. Chapter 18, destruction of man's governments, the governmental system that has kept people away from God. So it's difficult to just say it. It's, it's tough to. But so it, question. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I feel kind don't of dumb sorry. with this chapter. I don't know why. I think my mind's somewhere else. Um, so the woman you said is all the false religions. Does that manifest as a person? No. Or is it just symbolic? It, it's a symbolic. John is given a, a vision of when John is given these visions and he's given visions of stuff that we can't hardly imagine that we can't understand. God is giving him a vision, a visual. Let me, let me say it this way. God is giving him a visual reference point for what is in God's mind. So when God looks at false religion with all its pretentiousness, right? All its pomp and ceremony and all of its false stuff. This is what he, he in essence sees. Right? It's not something that's real. It's a, it's a visual aid so that John can describe it for us. But there's a, there's a hatred that God has for false religion that manifests itself in this miserable prostitute, in this horrible prostitute. But the actual the, the prostitute is not a real person. Is, does that make sense? It's a visual aid for John. Yeah, I, I guess. I don't, I don't know. I don't, like sound, I don't, I don't sound like you're I'm, too sure, Tracy. You know, I, I, my mind is elsewhere right now, but um, because in verse three, it says this woman is sitting on the scarlet beast. Is this a beast that they've already talked about in the previous chapters or is this a chapter 12? One? Yeah, chapter 12. And the, that beast, the beast that she's sitting on is Satan. Right. And so. God sees Satan as this miserable, horrible, vicious beast. But Satan, we're told, was the most beautiful creature in the universe. Right? We would look upon Satan if he would manifest himself to us and say, how stunningly beautiful is that creature? But God sees the inner Satan. He sees the inner. Right? He sees the spiritual nature of things. So this is a visual manifestation of the spiritual nature behind false religion. Because we look at some false religious churches, you know, if you've ever been to the Far East, to Thailand or places like that, and you see those Buddhist temples, they're stunning. They're absolutely stunning. But they're not spiritually. You know, visually they are, but spiritually they're evil places. So this is just this is just the visualization from John's point of view that Satan of all the false religions that Satan has created. Yes. Yeah, okay. false religion has ridden on the back of Satan since the Tower of Babel. Okay. Oh. And 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 she's sitting there and Satan is sitting there because essentially it's all Satan. Right. Yes. yes. And enjoying the fact that people are being killed and martyred for God. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And then, and then he's eventually going to bring other people to help him and then destroy them as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. And he's still doing good... hey, what? Just this last week, we had, an, uh, I think it was Nigeria, we had 18 Christians killed. A Muslim terrorist just walked in and shot them. And so we have a false religion celebrating over the death of believers in Christ. And Satan is driving that alone. That was just this week. So, yeah, John is given a visual of how heaven sees false religion. As heaven understands who is driving and who is carrying along false religion and what what results from false religion you got a question no i'm just <laughs> seriously i know that was a lot chapter 17 is a admittedly very very difficult chapter to understand and to wrap your heads around 
So take some time and pull out a piece of paper and a pencil and go back and read it and question. If you've got a question, verse one, write it down. If you've got a question, verse two, write it down. Bring them to me or email them to me or whatever, and I will get an answer and we'll keep at it till we all understand. Okay? Deal? Deal? Has anybody read any of their books that they took Sunday? No. Good. <laughs>